This is Hitta from Earthwatch. What you should be seeing is a slide on your screen that says turn the tide for Giving Tuesday and has a cool drawing of a shark on it. Um, there's also a capability for everyone on the side where you can type in comments and questions. We have some folks standing by here to help with any technical difficulties you might be having. So feel free to type into that side box if you have any questions or something's not working if you need a hand. Everyone participating, just so you know, is muted just so we don't get feedback or you know dogs barking in the background or whatever you might have going on at your house. Um, and the only folks you'll hear are myself and our speaker who I'll introduce shortly. Um, I'm just going to turn to our folks on the technical side here. Does it look like most folks are logged on and kind of ready to go? Got yeah, heads shaking, nodding. Excellent. So with that, we'll kick things off. So welcome everyone to the Earthwatch webinar. Today we're going to be hearing from Dr. Damian Chapman, who's an associate professor at Florida International University. He is also a principal investigator with us here at Earthwatch um, and leads an expedition in Belize studying sharks. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Damien to tell us all about his great research and findings. All right, let's see. Bear with us here as we're switching presenters. This is our, we're, we're a little new to this software, so you're learning right beside us. So Damien, I think we should be able to hear you now. Yes, excellent. And can you see the presentation? Oh, hang on, I just got no, a Not quite yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. we see your face. <laughs> see my face? Yeah, I see the nice uh, New Zealand All Blacks logo there. All right, um, let me just open up and share screen. Uh, desktop. Oh, there, there we go. See the desktop now? Yeah, we see your screen and got a lot of folders on your desktop, PowerPoint. There we go. Now we got just the slide and a great shark picture. <clears throat> okay. Awesome. Should be good. All right. So thanks very much. Um, when most people think about sharks, they probably think about this beast right here, a great white shark lurching towards them with its mouth wide open. Um, when you think about sharks, that's probably a pretty unusual thing uh, because most sharks aren't like that at all. There's actually about 1,250 species of sharks and their relatives to the rays. And this presentation is about how our project, Shark Conservation in Belize, which is funded by Earthwatch, uh, has actually done a bunch of conservation work in Belize with sharks and rays. And in the process, we have done a plus one. We've, we've added a species of shark uh, to the list. So I'll get to that at the very end of the presentation because it's a rather roundabout way uh, to get there. So when you think about sharks, um, you might think about this species, the whale shark, which is the largest uh, fish in the sea. They grow to about um, 20 meters in length and they uh, strain plankton and fish eggs and things like that from the water. So they eat very minute sea creatures. When most people think about sharks though, they probably don't realize that most sharks are small. In fact, 65% of all species are less than one meter uh, at maturity. Uh, and this species right here is one of the smallest. This is a cookie cutter shark. And in the top right, you'll see one alongside a pencil. So you get a sense just how small this is. Um, but even though this is a really small species, it's uh, got quite an attitude because the, what they feed on, unlike the giant whale shark that feeds on tiny organisms, uh, this guy uh, uses its entire body as a lure in the deep sea 
to attract larger animals like marine mammals and uh, tuna and even great white sharks. And basically they, they rush in to eat the cookie cutter shark and the cookie cutter shark takes, turns the tables and inflicts this bite that you see on the sea lion's posterior and removes a plug of flesh uh, and, and takes off. So even though many sharks are small, that doesn't mean they don't have uh, quite the attitude. So we have all these species of sharks and many of them around the world are really important food resources for coastal communities. We've been fishing sharks as long as we've been fishing. And although traditionally meat was the main product uh, uh, for, from sharks, uh, in recent decades, the main uh, sort of uh, the main reason sharks are being killed is for their fins, which are used in the Chinese delicacy shark fin soup. A shark fin soup is a delicacy that's served at banquets and weddings and special events. It fetches about a hundred US dollars a bowl, and so far we know there's at least a hundred countries around the world that fish for sharks. And all of those fins uh, go uh, through various, various channels uh, to China and Hong Kong and Singapore, Japan, Taiwan, but mainly Hong Kong and, and China where the, where the soup is prepared and consumed. So uh, some colleagues and I did an estimate, a very, very rough estimate of how many sharks must be killed every year by humans. And it's not just for the fins, but the fins is one of the big drivers. And we came up with a number that was kind of staggering. It was 100 million sharks killed per year by humans. And you might be surprised that that number is actually sort of the basement number. The very, we were very, very conservative when we made this estimate. So it's a huge, huge number of sharks getting killed, a lot of them for their fins, a lot of them for their meat uh, by humans. And you can really see it when you go to China and Hong Kong. They have these big areas where they lay the fins out in the sun to dry. And you just see these vast warehouses of fins everywhere. So you really do get a sense that 100 million is, is about the right number for how many sharks are being killed each year. So sharks have a life history that's a lot like us in that they mature late in life. Um, they have relatively few offspring and they um, really don't replenish themselves very quickly. So their age at first re reproduction for many species is 10, 11 and 12 years of age. So, uh, and then they live a long time and produce relatively few offspring. So it's just not a very productive group of animals. So in other words, when you take too many, it's very, very easy to push them to the point where the population declines. So given these life history traits and 100 million being killed per year, it's not too surprising that where we have data on population trends over time, we see a lot of these species in severe decline. Uh, for example, this is the oceanic white tip shark, species that used to be super abundant in the open ocean and in, in, in all warm, uh, temperate and tropical oceans around the world. And uh, now they've declined by at least 90% in the last 20 years, and probably even more if you look back to the 50s. So we, we really are taking these sharks out at a rate at which their populations are unable to sustain. So my team and I have actually done undercover work in Hong Kong and China looking at the fin trade we find that there's about a hundred species of sharks and some rays in the fin trade. And about one third of these species in trade, we find that scientists classify as being threatened with extinction. So in a nutshell, this is a global problem. We have sharks declining and we have exploitation rates that are far too high. So it is a global environmental problem. And you might be surprised that when you look at the globe, it's a very large place, but we're actually looking for answers on how to solve this global problem in this little speck right here, which is Belize, Central America. So you might be asking why Belize? Well, let's just start with the very basics of Belize. It's a very small country. 
uh, in Central America, bordered by uh, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. And it actually has the second largest barrier reef on Earth along its coast, the Belize Barrier Reef. And it has three of the four coral atolls in the Western Hemisphere. So it has a lot of great reef habitat. It also has a lot of shark species. It has at least 50 species of sharks, which for the Caribbean region is pretty much all of the species you'd expect to see. Things like nurse sharks, tiger sharks, lemon sharks, and great hammerheads. So it has this diversity of sharks, like many countries in the region. But really, why Belize is such an interesting little test tube to work to solve this global environmental problem is that Belize is emblematic of virtually every country, or particularly developing countries, that is grappling with this problem of how do you manage the sharks. And it's really a juggling act because on the one hand, Belize, like many other nations, has a whole bunch of fishermen who are, who are small scale fishermen and they really rely on fishing as their main um, source of livelihood. Then at the same time, you have the sharks in the water performing vital ecological functions as top predators. And it's important that we maintain this ecological function for the integrity of marine ecosystems. And then in Belize as well, you have a burgeoning ecotourism industry based on sharks. There's some world famous uh, shark dives such as Shark Ray Alley and the Blue Hole. And in a recent survey, uh, it was found that most divers in Belize were the thing they were most excited to see when they were there were sharks. So sharks are actually living tourism attractions for Belize. So you've got these competing uses of fishing, and tourism and the maintenance of biodiversity and these, these species. And like I say, Belize uh, has to deal with this challenge and most other countries have to deal with this challenge as well. So for us, Belize is a place where we can perhaps learn how you do this juggling act successfully so that we can transplant the lessons learned into Belize into many other countries sharing these same issues. So Belize is not a rich country. Um, they have one government department that's largely looking uh, responsible for managing sharks. That's the Belize Department of Fisheries. And they have two basic strategies at this stage. And we're working on more with them, which I'll get to later. But their two basic strategies is to protect certain species. So they've actually protected whale sharks and nurse sharks throughout Belize. So in other words, fishermen are not allowed to target these species. And if they were to accidentally catch one, they would have to release it alive. The other thing that Belize has is a network of marine protected areas, which are these areas shown in purple uh, and the areas shown in red. So the purple areas are areas where there are some major restrictions on fishing. The red areas are where there is no fishing allowed at all. So these protected areas uh, are basically areas where sharks uh, could potentially live uh, free of fishing. So they've got the, these two strategies, protect a couple of species and then protect areas. So we really want to work with the Belize Department of Fisheries to figure out, is this strategy working? Uh, for sharks and what can we do to improve it if improvements are needed. So our first stop on looking at this is Glover's Reef Marine Reserve, which is uh, a place I've been working since 2000. It's one of the oldest marine reserves or protected areas in Belize and it's an offshore atoll. It's actually the southernmost of the three offshore atolls. So Glover's Reef, you can see in the map, this is when you walk off the dock, they actually have a map showing the protected area. So the green triangle in the southern third of the atoll is actually the place where no fishing is allowed at all. And the dark blue area is 
where there are severe restrictions on fishing. And actually, the fishing that's done in the rest of the atoll, this, this, this blue area, um, there are certain prohibitions on gear, like monofilament gill nets and long lines, that are actually the primary gear used by fishermen in Belize to catch sharks. So effectively, the entire protected area of Glovers has no shark fishing at all. So we have a special permit from the Belize Department of Fisheries, which since 2000 has enabled us to set research long lines. And these are just big long lines about a mile long that have 50 baited hooks and we set them exactly the same way over and over again. We catch sharks on these lines, we measure them, we tag them, um, and we collect data on what's called catch per unit effort, which is the, the rate of catch. So how many sharks we catch per long line per hour. And by doing that, we're able to measure over time whether that is that number's increasing, stable, or decreasing. And what we really would like to see in a protected area is that that number is stable or increasing. We wouldn't want to see it decreasing because that would indicate that the populations are declining. So for the past five years, we've been doing this survey and other work with the assistance of Earthwatch uh, volunteers. And they have been absolutely instrumental to this study and others that I'm gonna be talking about uh, to enable us to, to achieve um, uh, uh, these studies. So what do we catch on our long lines? Well, the ones that everybody wants a picture of are things like the tiger sharks, the great hammerheads, the black tips. These are kind of big shark species uh, that are well known all around the world. These are species that we catch very, very rarely at Glover's Reef. So when we catch one, we usually uh, go ahead and take a picture. The main species we catch in Belize is actually the nurse shark. Uh, again, a protected species in Belize. So nurse sharks are very common in Belize and we see all the way from babies to adults. Um, a lot of our volunteers, the first time they see a nurse shark, they actually think they're a big catfish. But I can assure you they are actually a shark. The second most common species and one that's a real focus of our research is the Caribbean reef shark, Carcharhinus perezi. It's part of the shark family Carcharinidae, which actually includes most of the iconic species uh, such, as, such as tiger sharks and bull sharks and blue sharks that are known throughout the world. They grow from, they start life about 65 centimeters total length and grow to 240 centimeters, so they're a pretty big shark. They are endemic from Bermuda to southern Brazil. They live on the coral reef and they are the main species associated with shark dive ecotourism in the Atlantic Ocean. They are also the main species associated with shark dive ecotourism in the Atlantic, and they are in Belize and elsewhere fished for their meat, fins, and a variety of other products. In Belize, they are only protected when they are inside a well-enforced marine reserve. So this is why we're very interested in this particular species because they would be a barometer for whether the marine reserves are actually working. So this is a length frequency distribution for Caribbean reef sharks that we've caught in Belize. Um, the dotted lines are the size at maturity for males and females. So what you see is that we catch babies, teenagers, and adults of both sexes. And you can see that in pictures. So here's one of our volunteers with a baby. And here's some of our volunteers and staff measuring an adult male Caribbean reef shark. So we have the complete life cycle taking place at Glover's Reef. And we've actually tagged a whole bunch of animals and we've been able to show that uh, when we recapture them, when they're young, they grow anywhere from five to 18 centimeters per year. And 
when they reach maturity, which we think is about five or six years old, they actually slow down their growth to only about two or four centimeters per year. So they take a little while to mature, like most other sharks. So in Belize, our catch rates um, have actually been stable since 2000, which is very significant because as I said in the beginning, in most places around the world, what we have is declining shark populations. So the catch rates would be going down. But what we actually find is that our catch rates are hovering at about the same level, which is very good because this tells us that this population is healthy and it's not declining, which makes sense because it's inside a marine reserve, which means hopefully it's not exposed to fishing. So we wanted to look at this in a little more depth, and to do that, we wanted to track the movements of Caribbean reef sharks at Glovers. And our idea was that this might be working, this marine reserve might be working for this species because they are residents of the protected area, which means they are almost never exposed to fishing. So to address that question, we use a technique called remote acoustic telemetry. Basically what it entails is when we would catch a Caribbean reef shark on our long line, I would lean over the side, uh, make a small incision into its body wall, insert a transmitter that emits a unique coded signal for every individual, and insert that into its body cavity, and then sew the animal up uh, all over the side of the boat. What would then happen is we would re release the shark, and we had these things called receivers. And the receivers were anchored all over Glover's Reef, and that's depicted here by this red dot on the map. And when the reef shark would swim into the uh, range of the receiver, which is about 500 meters, its transmitter would set off the signal, which would be recorded by the receiver, where it would note down the identification number, the date, and the time. And it would stop doing that whenever the shark moved out of the range of the receiver. So we would go back, retrieve the receivers, and we would know if over, say, a six month period or a year period, which of the individual sharks had passed by that receiver. So it's a way of keeping track of these animals. So what we were able to do is maintain an array of about 21 receivers. And we looked at this for a period of 18, oh, sorry, two years. And what I'm showing you now is the results for 34 different Caribbean reef sharks. So each of those numbers, like 0018, is a different individual Caribbean reef shark. And at the top of the graph, you'll see January, February, March, April, May. So this is the whole course of a year. And basically, this tells us if there's a box under the month, it tells us we recorded that particular shark somewhere in our array of receivers at Glover's Reef. If the box is black, it means we heard from it uh, nearly every day. If it's gray, it means we heard from it about half the days of that month. If it's a white box, it means we heard from it for a few days, probably less than a week. And if there's no box there, it means we didn't hear from it that particular month. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but what you should be seeing here, what the, the key pattern is, is that most of the individuals were detected every month at Glover's Reef. So they are not making big migrations in and out. They tend to be residents of this particular protected area. And that absolutely makes sense. When you, when you add our time series showing stable populations and you show a resident group of, of individuals making up that population, it tells us that the marine reserve is working for, these, for this particular species. So at the same time, we also tracked some of our nurse sharks. Um, the nurse sharks were the same. We found that they lived at Glover's Reef. They didn't leave. They were detected every single month. Now, for a reef shark leaving, it's a bit of a problem because once they leave, they enter water where they may encounter fishing gear. However, nurse sharks, it doesn't matter so much. If they leave the marine reserve, they're still protected by law. 
We also tracked tiger sharks. Now, tiger sharks were a bit different. We put the transmitters in these tiger sharks and we almost never ever detected them ever again at Glover's Reef, maybe once every six months or so. So the tiger sharks and probably the great hammerheads and the black tips and the lemon sharks that were quite rare at Glover's, they were not only rare, but they were transient visitors. So the tra we hypothesized that the reason for that, the, them being rare, is that they move so much that they leave the protected area on a regular basis where they encounter fishing gear and get caught. So our hypothesis was that these species, the tiger sharks, the great hammerheads, the lemon sharks that are more mobile than nurse sharks and reef sharks, they are not being well served by the um, marine reserve network. Uh, and so the, those species could be declining throughout the lease. So with Earthwatch support, what we decided to do was to open up our research beyond Glover's Reef to see if our lessons from Glover's Reef applied for the entire country. So we switched our methodology from longline fishing to using something called baited remote underwater video or BRAV, which is basically a GoPro camera uh, positioned on a frame, which is set to record continuously for 80 minutes, dropped on the seafloor in front of about one kilo of chopped up bait. And each bruv basically sits there on the seafloor and records, and sharks and other animals are attracted to the bait, and they swim into the field of view, which enables us to count how many there are coming in. And from that, we're able to look at uh, the uh, abundance of sharks in different places. So what we're able to do is travel around Belize, go to different locations, and see if we can find, uh, you know, how many, we'll see if we can measure how many different sharks, uh, the abundance of sharks in different places. And not just reef sharks and nurse sharks, we wanna look for hammerheads, tigers, black tips, these species that we weren't finding at Glover's Reef. So overall, we went to seven different locations in Belize, um, and three of them are like Glover's Reef in that they're marine reserves, and four of them are areas open to fishing. And we picked different reef habitats. We picked sites along the barrier reef, and we picked uh, atoll sites that are a bit further offshore. So at each site, we basically used geographic information systems to, um, to uh, define a sampling area, and then we set 50 to 100 individual bruvs at each spot. And then we watched every single bruv and counted how many sharks of each different species um, we recorded in those 100 or 50 to 100 bruvs. And by doing that, we were able to compare the, the abundance of sharks in these different places. And our, our hypothesis was that the protected areas, the, the areas denoted in green, would have more, at least, reef sharks than the other places. So here's result of a brav. Um, you can see the bait cage, you can see a couple grouper, and you can see two nurse sharks laying on the bottom, sucking on the bait. So when we set bruvs, it really didn't matter where we go, except right close to Belize City, uh, we found nurse sharks everywhere. And that makes a lot of sense because they're protected everywhere and the fishermen aren't really killing a lot of nurse sharks. So nurse sharks we think are doing very, very well in Belize and have nothing to worry about. This is a brav set at Glover's Reef, and you will see a beautiful little Caribbean reef shark swimming in and out. Now, unlike the nurse sharks, they're a little more active swimming up in the water column. They don't laze about on the bottom. And these little guys are very hungry. They really make a good effort to try to get the bait, but they are unable to do so because of that cage. So we would watch these clips and we count how many Caribbean reef sharks we see. And what we saw for Caribbean reef sharks was a very, very distinct pattern. 
And this graph shows that pattern. So the, the graph here depicts the percentage of bravs at each of our seven sites that have Caribbean reef sharks on them. So you'll see at Half Moon Lighthouse on the far right, nearly 60% of our bravs had at least one Caribbean reef shark swim into the field of view. In contrast, the, the bravs set at Belize City, we had absolutely no sightings of Caribbean reef sharks. And when we, when we do all kinds of statistical modeling on these data, and what should be evident in this graph, if you look, the green sites, the marine reserves, we tend to see more Caribbean reef sharks than we do in the red zones, the areas open to fishing, with one exception in that Sandbore Lighthouse, which is a very remote site. It's not a marine reserve, but there's very little fishing there. So overall, what the data from the Brubs is telling us countrywide is the marine reserves are really important for Caribbean reef sharks. And that's where we see many, many more Caribbean reef sharks than the fish areas, which tells us that fishing is having a very large impact on this particular species outside of the protected areas. So overall, nurse sharks are resident and they are prohibited country ride and we find them everywhere. Caribbean reef sharks are residents of particular reefs and we find them in area and they are fished uh, and we find that they are only really common in, in reserve reefs or reefs where because of their remoteness uh, have very little fishing. But the really scary thing that we found with this survey was that we didn't find very many hammerheads. We didn't find very many tiger sharks. We didn't find very many black tip sharks. So these more mobile species that are also fished are not common anywhere that we surveyed. And this is cause for alarm because this tells us that the strategy of protecting a couple of species and then having some protected areas probably isn't working for the majority of sharks in Belize. So we have taken all of these data to the Belize Department of Fisheries and I'm happy to report that this group of people is very receptive to doing more for shark conservation in their waters. So we told them that they're doing a good job for nurse sharks. They're doing a good job with the marine protected area system for Caribbean reef sharks. But what they're lacking is other measures that will protect the hammerheads, the black tips, the tigers, the lemons, and things like that. The species that move between fished areas and reserves and the species where there are no protective measures specifically in place. So the Belize Department of Fisheries uh, actually developed a shark working group consisting of myself, fishermen, and some other scientists and conservationists. And we are now working on a solution to the problem. And the very first question that the fisheries department had was, well, we don't know anything about which species the fishermen are catching, how big they are, and where, you know, whereabouts they're fishing. We really don't have any basic information to be able to put in place any other types of measures uh, that would work to protect these species. So I came up with a strategy, and that strategy was to ask fishermen, uh, when they're preparing a shark and cutting off the fins, to take this fin, the anal fin, from every shark they caught, to dry it in the sun like they did for the other fins, and then put that particular fin in a shopping bag and then give it to us so that we could look at what species are being caught. And because that anal fin, they don't actually sell for anything. So it's essentially a byproduct. So initially I used DNA testing on those anal fins to identify species. But what we later found was that each individual species has a unique uh, shape and color to their anal fin. So we could actually just look at them and identify what species uh, the fin came from. So we did a pilot trial at Turner Atoll, which is one of our sampling areas where sharks have really been hit by fishing. And we had the fishermen there provide anal fins over from 2007 onwards. And what we find is they were fishing about eight different species of sharks. 
The dominant ones were Caribbean reef, the species we know very well from Glovers, and the Caribbean sharp nose, which is a small species. They also fished black tip, lemon, great hammerhead, and a couple of others. And what we saw over time was alarming. We actually saw that the black tips, lemons, and great hammerheads actually started to disappear over our survey period. Uh, at the same time, we measured the anal fin uh, because obviously a smaller shark has a smaller anal fin. And we were able to show that most of the Caribbean reef sharks that were being caught were babies. In fact, very few of them were mature, despite the fact that the fishing gear being used was very capable of catching big Caribbean reef sharks. So any fishery biologist worth his salt will tell you an overfished population is one that's composed mainly of juveniles. So this tells us that this population at Glover, at Turniff, is almost certainly overfished. So we took this information from our pilot run at Turniff to the Belize Department of Fisheries, and with that, coupled with our work at Glover's, gave them really serious cause for concern that we have big problems with overfishing. Uh, particularly with species like black tips, hammerheads, lemon sharks. Um, and I'm really happy to report that I am meeting with them in two weeks and we are going to really start what we need to do to make some serious changes. So what we're going to do is we're going to make anal fin sampling compulsory from all sharks throughout the country. Uh, we're going to do that starting December. We're going to reconstruct the entire species and size composition of the catch, and that'll give us data that we need to assess key species and introduce catch limits and other types of management measures that Belize is in sore, sore need of if they're to get things uh, back to how they should be. So in other words, tune in. We are going to get them the data and work with them so that they can start to rebuild these, these other sharks. And now for the bit you've all been waiting for. In our prior, preliminary trials of looking at the anal fins throughout the country, we actually found that one of the key species being fished is this little species of hammerhead. It's called a bonnethead, Sphena tiburo. This, these fish here are all adults. So they only, they only grow to about 120 centimeters. And they are currently described as one species in the Atlantic that's distributed all the way from North Carolina to Southern Brazil. And here is a bruv video from the Florida Keys just showing how cute the little bonnethead sharks are. Now, interestingly, when we, when we looked at the bonnethead sharks, uh, from Belize, when, and then when I say looks, when we looked at their DNA, we found something really surprising. We actually compared their DNA to bonnethead sharks in Florida and the Bahamas and um, in the Gulf of Mexico states of the United States and Mexico. And what we found was that their DNA was incredibly different. In fact, so bad that the first run of sequences I got back, I thought I made a mistake. And I went back and tested them again, and sure enough, I found that their DNA was incredibly different. And so we ended up collecting about 100 anal fins from bonnet heads in Belize, and we found they were all like that. So when we look at that DNA, we found that the amount of difference is enough to classify them as a distinct species. In fact, we estimate that it hasn't interbred with other bonnet heads uh, further north for more than 5 million years, which is more than enough time for them to become a separate species. So that was a very unexpected yet exciting finding that in this day and age, we can have a species of shark sitting right under our nose that we don't even know exists. So I'm happy to report that we published our initial findings to announce that we, we potentially have a different species. And my team is poised to go out with fisheries in December and collect specimens so that we can name and describe this new species. 
this has major conservation implications because obviously it's described as one species from North Carolina to Brazil. And if we break it up into multiple species, it automatically means it has smaller populations and potentially different threat outlooks. So we may have to classify this new species as, as you know, potentially more at risk than we thought bonnet heads were throughout their distribution. More than that, this new species has really galvanized the Belize Department of Fisheries because they feel that there's this new species that sort of belongs to Belize and now they're really fired up to describe it with me and do what needs to be done to protect it. So overall, Belize is at a crossroads where it really needs to do this juggling act right. They need to manage sharks to maintain the fishery, they need to maintain tourism on sharks, they need to maintain the biodiversity they have, including this new species, and they need to maintain sharks to, to really maintain that ecological role that they play. The measures they have, which are species protections, uh, which in this case applies to nurse sharks and whale sharks, is, seems to be working for those species. The protected areas seem to be working for reef sharks, but overall, most of the sharks they have in Belize are not well protected. So we need to make new plans for these species and we need to con do continued monitoring of the protected species in places to make sure that those uh, measures that are in place and working continue to work. So overall, our research program with Earthwatch is very, very important because it gives us an ability to work long term in Belize with the local people and the authorities to meet these research and management needs. So hopefully we can get this juggling act just right in Belize. And hopefully, too, is if we learn how to do it properly in Belize, we can transplant these lessons to other similar nations and make a difference globally for shark conservation. So I would really like to thank Earthwatch Institute as our primary funder in Belize, also Global Finprint, who supports a lot of our grub surveys in places other than Glovers, Turnip, and um, Southwater Key, and our most recent funder, the Mays Family Foundation, who have given us a donation to keep going. And I'd really like to thank my crew, my students, my co-PIs, and Wildlife Conservation Society and International Zoological Expeditions, Department of Fisheries, and a big thanks to all of our volunteers over the years because without them, this work would not be possible. So with that, I would like to uh, open up for questions, which I'd be happy to answer now. Thanks, Damien. Um, I'll read off a few of the questions we've been getting and I'll note too for folks who have some on your mind and haven't had a chance to submit them yet, there's a button that says Q&A on your screen and you can click on that to submit questions and we'll read off of there just so we get the tech side taken care of. Um, so the first question we'll read off. Um, Um, is from Betsy Snow, and Betsy is asking, do you think the bonnet heads um, outside of Belize include other new species? Yeah, that's a really, really great, great question. So um, I think there's a strong possibility that there might be another species uh, in South America. So I think <coughs> it's very possible that you've got Bahamas and US and Mexico is one species. The Central American Caribbean and Caribbean islands as a second species, and then potentially Venezuela South as being a third species. Um, the reason I think that is because there's other small sharks that show that same pattern. Um, and I've just recently procured samples from Brazil, which will undergo testing shortly so that we can think about that. So at this stage, I do think we might be dealing with more than just the one species. And what's 
really important about that is that in Brazil, for example, the bonnet heads are nearly extinct. So it's not such a big deal if they were, you know, one of these more widely distributed species, but if they are a distinct species in Brazil, that is a critically endangered species. So this is why this sort of exploration is very, very important. All right, thanks for that. Um, another question we've gotten in um, from Kristen is, do you think things like Shark Week are good for shark conservation, perpetuating myths or understandings? What's your, your view on them connecting to conservation? I think generally speaking, um, Discovery Channel and Shark Week have been very good <coughs> about um, uh, putting on programming that connects people to sharks and, and makes people uh, want to uh, support uh, investments in shark conservation. Um, in the past couple of years or few years, there's, there was a move towards more sensationalistic shark attack and fake documentaries that I think were pretty poor and in, more, in the sense that it portrayed sharks as bloodthirsty killers and also perpetuated scientific, uh, 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 unscientific ideas out there such as Megalodon still existing. Um, and sort of some people didn't realize that those documentaries were fake. Um, but I, in the last Shark Week, I think they made more of a move towards science and conservation. So overall, I, I think they're probably back on the right track now. Excellent. We've got questions flooding in. So thanks everyone for being so productive and sending those questions. This one's from an anonymous viewer. How does your research within Belize compare to other scientific research happening regarding sharks and marine protected reserves in other regions of the world? Are others finding similar results? I think I got most of that. Can you, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'm just firing up a logo right now. Um, if you can still see my screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, if you go to www.globalfinprint, Dot org, um, which I can I can put up later. Uh, I'm actually running the world's largest shark survey, and we are doing the Brav method on 400 different reefs all over the world to answer this very question that you're asking me. I can tell you that we are we've done about 200 reefs already, and Belize comes out as being qu quite good in terms of sharks um, compared to other parts of the Caribbean. Uh, however, what we do see is that uh, 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 places like the Bahamas, where there's no shark fishing at all, we see a lot more Caribbean reef sharks than we do in Belize. And we also see those tiger sharks, hammerheads, lemon sharks, black tips, because those migratory species are protected throughout the whole country. Um, so Belize, um, Many other countries, we see no sharks at all. So Jamaica, we've only seen a handful of nurse sharks, for example, and they have no shark management at all in Jamaica. So Belize comes out as being middle of the pack um, and maybe slightly on the good side. Um, but the shining examples of places like the Bahamas where they have done a really good job of protecting their sharks. Thanks, Damien. Um, another question kind of that builds nicely on that, um, talking about your data. So when you're using bruvs, since sharks aren't individually tagged, how do you control for seeing the same individuals over and over and not counting them more than once? That's a great question. We, we actually, um, uh, we don't count them individually. What we do is we score every bruv as uh, the maximum number of each in the, of um, each species seen in frame at once. That's the metric we use. Um, so in other words, if there's a point in the video where there's five all in frame, we know at minimum there were five sharks around. Um, so we don't use an absolute count of abundance. We use a relative measure between bruvs. And the bias, um, of course, you know, not counting all of them, that bias is 
carried throughout the project. So uh, we can compare different sites because they all have that same uh, bias. So we don't actually count the absolute number, it's just measuring the relative abundance between the sites. Excellent. This next question is coming from Mel. Mel would like to know, I'm glad the Belize government has been so receptive to your research. Have you or your colleagues abroad had any successes with changing fishing practices, particularly in Asia? So yeah, I could say so. It's um, in general, uh, Asia uh, is not is more of a consumer than a fisher fishing um, region for sharks. Um, with some exceptions, Taiwan and Japan are very large shark fishing nations. So in Asia, we we have a two phase strategy. One is uh, to uh, to reduce demand for shark fin soup, and we're doing that with our undercover work uh, on the fin trade, showing that there's a lot of threatened species uh, in the trade, and we're going to work with other other organisations to directly com communicate that to the consumer. Uh, with the idea being that the consumer um, will hopefully be inspired to make uh, more sustainable seafood choices. And the good news is, is there's evidence that's actually taking place. We're actually also working with um, various international organizations uh, uh, that actually prohibit the trade across international boundaries of certain species of sharks. Uh, and we're working with the government in Hong Kong and China to actually enforce those regulations so that uh, basically there's certain threatened species that are not, uh, that nations are not allowed to trade without permits. We're saying we're working with the governments in Asia so that they would actually be able to enforce that legislation and, and hopefully reduce the fishing of those particular species. All right, good. Good feedback there and on a global perspective and focusing on Asia. Um, another question looking more at the ecological role of sharks. We have an anonymous viewer asking, what ecological role do Caribbean reef sharks and nurse sharks play in the barrier reef in Belize? Yeah, that's another great question. And that's actually one of the big ones we're trying to answer with our Earthwatch program moving forward. And we have some answers already. So, uh, of course, that's one of the big questions that the government of any nation asks is what happens if the sharks are removed in terms of the knock-on effects for the ecosystem? Because if, they, if there's big negative effects, then that's, of course, worth uh, helps justify the investment in, in, in um, protection. So, to give you an idea, there are two things or three things that sharks uh, can do. Uh, in, in a broad sense. One is by killing certain amount of their prey species, they control the population size of prey species. So the idea being if you take sharks out, there can be explosive growth in some of their prey species that then knocks on down the ecosystem and, 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 and causes what we call a trophic cascade of, of changes. And that typically, when we've seen them on, in, in terrestrial or land ecosystems, we, we see big changes, uh, oftentimes with negative consequences for, for humans. So we're investigating the possibility that that happens when uh, Caribbean reef sharks and others are removed. The other thing that sharks do is they frighten their prey. They actually frighten more of their prey than they do kill. So what actually happens is a lot of the prey species change their behavior according to whether sharks uh, live in the particular area or not. And we've actually seen evidence of this in Belize at Glovers. And specifically what we find is that stingrays at Glovers tend to live in really, really shallow water and they concentrate up there and they tend to avoid deep water where Caribbean reef sharks are. And what we find is that places where there's no Caribbean reef sharks, the, the, the stingrays have no problem going out in deep water. And that's important because stingrays actually turn out, they actually dig in the sediment uh, when they're feeding and burying themselves. And so they play an important role in, in turning over the sediments in shallow water. 
So if you remove Caribbean reef sharks, you actually dilute how much sediment turnover occurs in the very shallow water environment. And that could affect things like bonefish that are an important resource for, for game fishing. It could affect conch, which are important fishery themselves. So that's another unintended consequence. And then the last thing, as I said, this, the, the nurse shark especially might be one that's also turning over the sediments quite a bit uh, by digging and, and, and so on. So they actually can directly modify the habitat. So those are three sort of big areas where sharks may be important and we're still investigating to figure out the answers. Awesome. Thanks so much, Damien. We've got about a minute left. Um, so I'm sorry for the folks whose questions we didn't quite get to. There were a lot of really great ones, but we want to be conscious of everyone's time and we know you all have to get back to things. It's only a lunch hour. Um, Damien, if you could do me a favor and turn off your screen sharing so we can pop a slide up, that would be great. Okay. Is that Did that work? Um, we're getting there. We're clicking. <laughs> your side worked. We're fixing our end. <laughs> Got it? To the right? The PowerPoint? Yep. Got it. Full screen. Perfect. All right. There we go. Um, technology working in our favor today. So I just want to wrap things up. Thank everyone who's joined us on the webinar via their computers and their phones for, for coming in today. And a huge thank you for Damien for putting together a fantastic presentation, and letting us know everything that's going on with your research and um, giving such thoughtful responses to everyone's questions. Um, really appreciate you giving your time for this um, and talking with folks. Before we close off, I just want to remind everyone of what's on the screen today. Today is Giving Tuesday, um, and we really encourage everyone to make donations to Earth Lodge. You're without support from folks like you. We really can't support all the great research like Damien's and the many other scientists that we work with. Um, and it's really critical to supporting environmental science. Um, you can also sign up and join an expedition, but we know that's a bit higher of a financial leap and any, any gift that you can give um, is fantastic. Cool new feature we have, you can actually donate via text message and the number for that is here. Then you don't even have to put your phones down. And if you have any other questions um, coming out of this webinar or other questions for Earthwatch, you can email us directly at communications at earthwatch.org and we'd be happy to get back to you um, and keep in touch with us um, in all the different ways we have on our Facebook, our website. We'll try and keep you up to date with research results from all of our projects. Thanks again everyone for coming and have a great afternoon.